welcome to Swift Live. We've made it to the final of our classic series. I'm OJ Borge here in my pain cave. And I think over the course of this classic series, we've got older, we are wiser. And unless you've taken the brave step of cutting your own hair or have a hairdresser who lives at home with you, we're all a little more wild in our barnets. And I think personally, my hair is going backwards in times into the 80s. I've so far made it to Lost Boys, Goonies is next up. Uh, but there's no time for tears or wistful thinking as we have got a corker of a Crit City closer for you. And I love the Crit City course, we'll get onto that in a second. But before we get to that, and I said we weren't gonna reminisce, but we shall, just for a second, because we're gonna take a little look back at what happened when the women took on the waterfalls and the rope bridges of Watopia earlier in the week. Just describe how hard that finale was because it was very late when you crossed the line in first place. You often go too early. I mean, you can't sprint all out for 20 seconds. Then you're gonna die 50 meters of the finish. The finish is just around the corner, 100 meters to go. Harris is on the front. It looks like the New Zealand's gonna get it. A blanket finish. I rode the course like uh, 20 times this week. <laughs> so. <laughs> I had a close look at the finish. Tell us the time it is where, where you are now. Yeah, call me a Swiftaholic. It was 3.30 a.m. in Canberra, Australia when I got up this morning. It's now five o'clock in the morning and I, yeah, I'm not going back to bed. You must be really, really happy with the way things went today. I know I have a good kick on me, um, but I usually don't have the opportunity to really use it on the road because I'm not really seen as, as a sprinter. Um, but yeah, and Swift is pretty cool to give it all for the sprint and I was happy with the podium. Team Hino, what can we expect? Amazing, as always, uh, seeing Cecilia Hansen and Vicky Whitelaw going for it. And a great interview at the end there with Matt Stevens. Right, today's race to round off the Classic Series is one in Crit City. And if you haven't raced it before, for me, when they launched it a few months ago, blew my mind. I have in the past very badly raced actual Crit IRL. I got lapped on the third, on the third lap. A little bit embarrassing. But this is exactly like it. Fast, it's first, you hit the turns, little climbs. It is all about explosive power and knowing when to go. Timing is essential when it comes to Crit City. And for this final of our classics races, which of the men will be able to do that? To solo from way out or leave it to a bunch sprint? And remember, you can race these as well. That's what it's all about. Yes, it's great seeing these elite races with the pros and the semi-pros, but it's about you having a go as always. And roughly an hour after the race, we flick the switch and you can get involved. But you need to be quick. It's only there until April the 29th to race the final of the Classics courses. Now, one man who might be taking advantage of that opportunity is rising star Tom Pidcock. Although I don't know why we're calling him a rising star because the man is a polymath when it comes to riding bicycles. He can do absolutely anything on a bike. So he is a risen star. And quite recently, he's been trying his hand at Zwift Racing for the very first time, making it either his fifth or his sixth competitive discipline. Mountain bike track, cyclocross road, TT, and now Zwift. And Hannah Walker caught up with him earlier to find out how he's been finding the transition to Zwift Racing. So there's Tom Pidcock, again, one of the most talented riders on the planet at the moment, can excel at all disciplines. You can look at Matt, the heart rate that uh, Pickock is doing already, 183 beats per minute, just shows uh, the intensity already after only four and a half kilometers of racing. On, on Friday night, um, you did your second ever uh, Zwift Pro-Am uh, yeah. in the uh, Richmond Challenge. How was it? How have you found it? Well, honestly, they're so hard to me. I think I've found the discipline of cycling I'm not very good at. Like the first race, I like attacked at the start. I free wheeled to like, so the bunch catch me up quicker and then I like sprinted to get back on, but the bunch just flew past me. So then that was my race over. And then the second one, I was doing all right. Yeah, I lasted 15 minutes in that one and got to the climb. I'm not just going to stop having, having got dropped after 15 minutes. So for sure, I'm going to try and, try and uh, at least get a good result in one of these races. When did you first try Zwift? Good question, really. It became more of a thing this winter, really, especially before the World Champs. I got a cold the week before, so basically I spent the whole week on Swift. 
and then yeah then I flew to Switzerland and then raced the worlds and got second yeah it's certainly a tool that that makes indoor riding interesting your biggest competitive aims what are they going forward in, in cycling I want to achieve what I can do in cyclocross long term I just want to become the biggest cyclist in the world your fellow Yorkshireman Alistair Brownlee told us post race that you thought he found it too hard and you threw in the towel and you know sounds like a bit of fighting talk to me how do you think <laughs> in a one-on-one -on Zwift race with Alistair Brownlee, obviously double Olympic champion? Well, that's a good question, actually. I certainly got a better kick than him. I think I beat him in a sprint at the finish, but he's done well in these races, so obviously his tactics are, are pretty good. I think probably the current circumstances he's with. Um, are there are there any other competitive cyclists that you particularly look up to and, and admire? It's, it's a bit weird now because, like, obviously, Matthew, I like, I race against him now, but, like, I started cross when he was world champion. Yeah, he certainly is one of the people I look up to and because, yeah, he's just so dominant across whatever he does. And how is uh, Trinity racing team as a whole doing in Zwift? Are they enjoying it? Are they liking these races? I think they are, to be honest. It's something new. And I think certainly because none of us raced in such a long time, like, we're all, got, we're like, all pretty excited to start like, like I was in like, the first one. Do you, do you always yeah. have like team talks before it? Do you have a bit of a chat before of what you're going to do or how you're going to help each other or is it just go in and um, Yeah, we do a bit, but we don't really know how to help each other. It's more just keeping up with the with the guys who are, who are fast. So uh, that's, that's our team tactics. Well, Tom, thanks very much for the chat. Good luck on uh, Saturday. Look forward to uh, yeah. coming on you. Thank you. And... Hopefully, hopefully I'll do a little bit better that you actually have something to talk about that I'm not just dropped straight away. Tom Pidcock there talking to Hannah Walker and he says, yeah, I hope I don't get dropped. He's not going to get dropped this time. You've seen him race in many other disciplines. It'll be one of those things where he's not done well for a couple. Now he gets a handle on it, gets the tactics and probably wins the race. And we'll find out in a few minutes time when he gets underway on this Crit City course. Now, if you haven't uh, ever raced it and you're not familiar with it, there's one man I know, possibly a superhero, can tell us about it. That is Matt Stevens. It's about to get hot in Crit City. The final classic of the month is heading to the fastest course on Zwift for a fireworks finale. The races will be taking on 10 laps of the downtown Dolphin, going uphill on the cobbles and downhill through the park. In the closing kilometres, the battle for position will be ferocious between the remaining contenders as the downhill section will launch the riders right into the finishing straight. Long range attack or last minute sprint? Only time will tell. As Matt Stevens says, it's time to get hat in the city, the crit city. Let's take a look at the teams who have lined up. And what's been great is that as this classic series has gone on, we really have swelled in the amount of teams that are racing. Uh, and today is no exception. We've got the national teams again, uh, USA national team, Gracie Great Britain national team as well, racing for some national pride. And then just a whole host of other great teams that all of them, could be in with a chance. Trinity Racing, Tom Pidcock's team are there. Uh, Vitus, as always, my personal favourite team. I've got the fan jersey. Canyon ZCT have lined up. And then if we move through to the ones to watch, um, look at those names. In the Zwift world, these are big dogs. Ryan Christensen of Canyon DHB. Jesse Seaman of Turbo. James Phillips of Canyon ZCC. We have seen in the past do some amazing things. Sprinting, getting dropped, and then sprinting for the win. The man's a monster. But... As we get through all that, oh, and also remember Tom Pidcock. He says he hasn't done well before. Today could be the day. Let's get into the race. Uh, and I know it was mentioned last time that people have said this looks a little bit like a broom cupboard. Do I have a Gordon the Gopher? No, of course I don't. I have a Peter, the unicorn. Um, if you're watching this in North America, you don't know what the, uh, the broom cupboard is, or Gordon the Gopher, then Google is your friend. And Sorry, what's that, Peter? You know who's going to win today. Interesting. Who is it? Oh, I see. Well, with that in my ears, let's hand over to your commentators for today's race. That is Hannah Walker and first, Matt Stevens. Let's get it on! Well, thank you very much indeed there, OJ. Um, and glad to meet you as well, Peter the Unicorn. He could end up being the official mascot of uh, the Zwift Classics in the future. Uh, but that remains to be seen. Cracking race that's in store tonight. 15 laps of this very, very fast, this very technical uh, circuit for the final Zwift Classic. And alongside me, as ever, Hannah Walker. Hannah, I'm looking forward to this. It's going to be a grand finale. And it's been a great set of classics that we've had this time. 
Yeah, I'm certainly looking forward to this one. I love crits personally. Uh, they were always one of my favourites when I was uh, racing. Um, and yeah, we've had some fantastic racing throughout in both uh, the male and female classics. So uh, yeah, tonight's uh, not going to disappoint, I'm sure. And what sort of rider? I mean, we, we saw at the top of the show the kind of teams that are in this event. I mean, a lot of it, we're already on uh, lap number one as the field just stringing themselves out. There we go, 28.9 kilometres to go. Already 500 metres of this circuit done. We're going to be rattling around these laps pretty quickly, just over two minutes per lap, maybe two minutes and 20 seconds. This race should, uh, should set into a little bit of a rhythm. But just looking at the field that we've got here tonight, Hannah, what sort of rider do you think this circuit is going to suit? Well, this rider is uh, going to suit a, uh, a punchy rider, someone who's got very explosive power. Also, a rider who uh, tactically is very aware of what's going on around them. So positioning is key on a circuit like this, um, kind of not being on the front, but also not being too far back either. So, you know, keeping yourself within sort of the, the top 10, top 15 throughout. So make sure you're not wasting any energy on the front um, is the main thing. And also using uh, your team. Um, to be able to to help you get up there if you start you need someone to help you uh, bring you back towards the front um, and also going into to the final um, it's very tricky you know you, you have that uh, right hand hairpin and then it's only around 200 meters to the finish it's slightly downhill um, so yeah it's all about positioning and uh, someone who can recover well as, as well so uh, you know maybe a likes of a track rider there's a, uh, plenty of them in the Great Britain cycling team here uh, Ethan Vernon did very very well in the first classic um, so, yeah, look to someone uh, who's got great recovery. Indeed. Well, this is this little dog leg. This is essentially the U-turn, which is swinging. We're coming downhill, actually, and this is the finishing straight now. There you go, 1.8 kilometres down, and we're just rolling through. So that's your look at lap number one. Everything is still together at the moment. And uh, interestingly, Hannah, I was looking back at a, a few stats, a couple of races, as well as the Zwift Classics. There's racing every single day on Zwift. Uh, and I was looking at one of the Belgian Zwift riders who recently won on this circuit, just a few days ago, in fact, and that was Kenneth Merkin, a regular on Zwift. Um, very, very good rider. You can just see some of the power-ups just uh, fl the riders are using at the moment. But uh, he averaged around this circuit, just giving you an indication of how hard this circuit is, the sort of power you need to maintain. He averaged for 10 laps, 408 watts. So that just shows what it takes to... And this is this is a harder race as well. The, the field here is, is far stronger. So we're going to be looking at between 350, 400 watts average for today, Rick. Yeah, it's, it's very high watts. And the intensity um, is extreme because, you know, it's... We're looking at around probably yeah, 40 minutes, 45 minutes of racing tonight. So it's being able to sustain that effort for that amount of time because there's no let up on a course like this. Um, because, you know, obviously, as I said before, the positioning and um, it's just so fast and the laps are going by uh, so quickly. You know, as you said, I think around two and a half minutes, I think, per lap. Um, as you see, power ups now being used for uh, the first time. Lots of uh, green ones there, which are the, the feather power ups. Uh, and also a couple of arrows in there makes you uh, more aerodynamic for 15 seconds. Indeed. Well, it's worth going through as a look at the early part of the race. It's one of the Team Italy riders just going clear. That's Amasa. Got a slender lead. I think he's going to be reeled back in very, very soon. We can just see 7.1 watts a kilogram for the young Italian on the front at the moment. One of several national teams, as we mentioned, at the top of the program riding this. We've got the Dutch national squad here. They have the current Swift national champion amongst their number. We've got a young British team as well and the USA Junior National Team. They've got some really, really classy riders amongst their number. As we look at one of the most aggressive regular riders, Morten Vang from the Kalas team, one of the new teams that's formed around racing on Zwift, the Kalas Esports Racing Team. He's uh, the 2018 Zwift National Champion. So he's one of these riders that knows this circuit. And these laps are coming around very, very fast already. That's another lap down. So we're really looking, looking at around two minutes and 20 seconds per lap at the moment as Mikey Mottram of Team Vitus takes the lead. Yeah, Mikey Mottram, part of the, the winning team last week with Vitus Pro Cycling. They had a fantastic um, night of racing. I think it was very, very impressive uh, seeing that the pro teams coming through and, and challenging the, uh, the dedicated uh, esports teams. Ben Healy, another one uh, from Trinity Racing, who has really excelled in these classics um, and should be one to watch tonight, I think. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, it's worth reflecting back on that race just a little bit as we head into lap number three. That's Rory Townsend on the front, a very, very classy road rider, riding for Canyon DHB, the Continental team. 
the British squad. Krull now moves to the front from SEG. SEG Racing, actually, they're, in a, they're an academy team based out of the Netherlands. A very, very good setup, a feeder team to, to World Tour squads. They've actually renamed, since the lockdown has happened, they've actually renamed the squad SEG E Racing Academy. And they have a very, very interesting uh, rider amongst the number as we look at the picture in picture of Callum McCloy there. Callum McLeod, should I say, of Canyon DHB, hovering at around 300 watts. This that little uphill section on the circuit. Riders using the featherweight power-ups, the aero power-ups. We understand that, that on this particular circuit, Hannah, riders are getting power-ups around every five minutes or so. And um, as that's a pretty regular use of a power-up, you're not just going to use these power-ups to uh, assist in attacking. It's actually to save a little bit of energy midway through, especially on that little climb. Yeah, I think also even just to stay in the group, you know, it, the, the pace is so high uh, right now and it's, you know, there's never a let up. Um, so it's using the power ups to your advantage, but also, yeah, not uh, holding on or saving them like you would in some courses. So uh, on here, you can see we're on this like little uh, up and down roller coaster uh, like section. Um, as we get a, a little look of George Mills Keeling of the Ribble Well type pro cycling team, another UCI uh, continental professional uh, continental team. So uh, they've got the likes of uh, John Archibald and Dan Bigham in their squad. They have indeed a very, very good team indeed, both Bigham and Archibald. Bronze medalists last year in the first ever mixed team relay at the World Championships. Very, very classy riders indeed. And great to see the River Well tight uh, team racing on Zwift and enjoying it. And still getting to grips with the nuances of Zwift, the power-ups, the gamification, the way that you apply power. And uh, that was, I thought that was a really good interview that you had early on, earlier on at the top of the show, Hannah, that, that chat with Tom Pidcock. I did like that, that, that one of the last questions you asked him, what was his ambitions um, in, in, in terms of his uh, professional career? And he said, I want to become the biggest bike rider in the world. I mean, uh, that lad knows no bounds, does he? He is such a talent. And let, let's hope he can really stay in the mix and maybe affect the race towards the back end today. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, he, he just knows what he wants. He's got so much determination um, to be the best. And it, that shows in his results and also, you know, in his training, he'll come back into these races. And I do think, you know, race upon race, you know, Zwift, uh, you know, is, is another discipline. You have to learn what to do and, and how to race on it, how to use the power ups. Uh, also knowing the courses makes a huge difference. So I think, you know, the more that Tom uh, races and rides on Zwift, um, he's only going to get better and better. And I think we've been saw that in in last week's um swift classic in the second round you know he was better than the first week so um, i think it's only uh, a matter of time before we start seeing tom pickle winning on swift yeah definitely you know if there was a circuit well any let's say if there was a circuit designed for him i think on form and once he got to grips with uh, the way that swift is the way that it feels the sort of effort that you need i'm sure He's more than capable of running, uh, winning races on Zwift in the future. And you just never know about tonight. A lot of power-ups just been used back then. We'll go through the power-ups for you. We're on now on lap, midway through lap number four. We're just coming to the end of lap number four. Oh, an interesting rider, should I say, on the front at the moment. That is Krull. He rides for the SEG racing team. A very, very good time trial. He was second in the Netherlands under 23 at time individual time trial last year. So a very, very good rider, lots of power, happy to sit on the front and drag these along, but no attacks at the moment. I mean, this is the pace here, Hannah, is so, so high. We're coming towards the end of lap number four already. These laps are whizzing by very, very high speeds. And there's, there's hardly any opportunity on this course at all to, to rest. Look at the look at the watts here, between hovering between four and a half, five watts a kilo. That's very, very hard to maintain. Yeah, it's very, very hard. And, you know, this speed is just relentless. You see, in, you know, the heart rate, as we've seen on uh, all the riders that have been on the screen uh, from their home setups, the heart rate is so high. You know, it's going to be stay within, you know, around 170 to, you know, high 180 beats per minute uh, throughout the whole uh, of the race. Another rider who's very interesting uh, to me, Matt, is uh, Michael Zylard, the, uh, the son of Ron Zylard and the grandson of Yoke Zylard. Uh, many will know uh, of that family from the six day uh, circuit. Uh, so, another one to watch, very uh, young, up and coming Dutch star. As uh, Tom Pidcock here, get a little look of him in his uh, pain cave. Indeed, with Pidcock is uh, issuing his, uh, his team Trinity jersey, uh, keeping as cool as possible. Looking good. Good to see him still in the mix there, knocking out around two, well, two, two, 250 watts at the moment. A load more power-ups being, uh, being dropped. First sight of uh, Dan Bigham there. Very, very good rider indeed. An aerodynamics expert by date. 
and there's an excellent bike rider by night or vice versa, one of the two, but he is one of the most preeminent experts on aerodynamics in world cycling and an exceptional bike rider indeed. There's the stats of Mikey Mottram in second position at 8.6 watts a kilo, just trying to move off the front, but it's a P. Van Diemen of the Dutch national team who's just stolen a small little lead here. But as we're seeing, and lots of riders just try to go clear, but so, so hard to maintain the pace off the front. And as we know, there is uh, this drafting on Zwift, but if you do break away, it's very, very hard to keep off this pack as they rotate on the front. The best place to be is kind of, I don't know, 10th, 15th position, trying to hold your place, not exposing yourself to the draft out in front, but sitting in the wheels and trying not to slip back too far. Yeah, completely right, Matt. It's, uh, using that draft to your advantage uh, it is really key. And, you know, the only splits that we've really seen at the front of this peloton so far have only been, you know, around one or two seconds. Um, and as soon as they got on that downhill section, it's all brought back and it's all back together. Um, but that's just, you know, because the pace is so high in the bunch, um, everyone wants to maintain their position as well. No one wants to uh, drop back and have to make a huge effort uh, to move from the back of the peloton up back towards the front. So everyone's wanting to maintain that position towards the front. So it's just, you know, a real fight. It's just like in a, in a real life race, Matt, um, trying to maintain that position. It certainly is. And uh, as we as we'd expect, everything's still together at the moment. Not not too much elevation on this course, but the only climb on this circuit, remember, only 1.9 kilometers in length is only a couple of hundred meters long. So it's 200 meters long, but a 4% average does kick up to 6%. So it does hurt. It's a real spiteful little circuit. Not many opportunities to rest. And because the downhill after the climb isn't super steep, you can't actually free will. You need to keep applying the pressure, keep the power down on the pedals making this a course that is very, very difficult to recuperate, to recover on. But by virtue of getting these extra power-ups, we could see the power-ups being used more for recuperation than actually attacking. And on the climb again now, seeing all the feather power-ups being used, some aero power-ups as well. Remember, the aero power-up makes you more aerodynamic for 15 seconds, as we see a very aggressive Mikey Mopsrum move to the front again. The draft power-up, well, that gives you double draft benefit for 30 seconds. Now, the burrito, a very unusual little uh, logo that pops up makes you undraftable for 10 seconds so good if you want to attack without anybody grabbing your wheel and there's the invisibility power up my favorite power up which makes you invisible to the other riders for 10 seconds and then the feather power up well that's a very good one if you want to accelerate on a climb or we have a hilltop finish that makes you nine kilograms lighter for 15 seconds so in the finale if this does come down to a sprint getting the right power up could prove hannah to be absolutely crucial yeah, all these riders will want to uh, have the uh, the helmet aero boost uh, to make them more aerodynamic. Of course, I think it will end in a sprint this uh, this Crit City race, this classic. Um, so they'll all be looking to have that one. But I think um, any power up that they get uh, during the race, they'll be wanting to use, uh, you know, to keep themselves uh, in the group to have as much recovery as possible. Talking of the burrito, that I've never actually had it. All the invisibility. I'm quite jealous. That's of, a shame. Uh, you need to get, such you need a cool to get... one. You need to get racing a little bit more on Zwift. Uh, we'll have to get you on and we'll to, to make sure that uh, maybe take some screen grabs. That's the wonderful thing. If you're, if you're riding on Zwift using the companion app or you get around your keyboard, you can actually take screen grabs of your screen and then post them on social media. It's especially popular if uh, now we've got all these group rides on Zwift where riders are, are riding with the pro teams. You know, to get a little screen grab of riding with one of your heroes is uh, it's pretty cool, actually, as we see another parrot being dropped up at the front. <laughs> I was going to say, it's like the uh, the 2020 version of a selfie, isn't it? It certainly is. It certainly is. It's fantastic. I do like to take a little bit of a screen grab when I'm training, especially if my watts go above 220. I feel quite proud of myself. Anyway, one rider who can certainly double or triple 220 watts is Alistair Brownlee. He's really taken to Zwift racing very, very well indeed. He was a real animator a week or so ago in the London Classic. Just dropped away towards the back end, but really did shred that field putting out humongous watts on the climb and has really adapted exceptionally well and, and when you think about the effort of racing on Zwift we, we think that it's quite different to an effort on, in, a, in a triathlon which is a far more linear effort he's really adapted exceptionally well to the gameplay as well yeah he has and I think also you know the way he rode on, on the in the race um, tactically and technically he was very very good I think it's also because you know he follows cycling uh, as a whole he's always out uh, with a lot of the Yorkshire bike riders so understands um, how uh, cycling and bike racing works as well you know sort of using that um, the draft on, of the riders in front as well um, so 
yeah, I think he was exceptionally strong in London. It was just in the latter parts of the race where he tailed off. But he's got a very, very strong team around him tonight uh, the super, with the Super League triathlon. He's got uh, Hayden Wild, uh, Vincent Louis, uh, Jonas Schumberg, and uh, Tyner Misselschuk from uh, Canada. Um, so very, very strong team indeed. And they, they were uh, always present last week in Richmond too. They were indeed. It's a great team there in the uh, the blue shoulders, and then they have the orange and uh, white fade. And we did get a good shot of uh, John Mould, somebody you know very well, I believe, is actually racing in the house. What room is he racing in today? Of course, the former silver medalist in the Commonwealth Games road race, and a real exponent of racing on Swift. How's he doing? Can you hear him? Um, I can't actually, but I got the uh, door shut. It's like a, a game show, isn't it? It's like, which room is he racing in tonight? Uh, but he's in the kitchen. So, um, yeah, windows open, fans blaring. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure he's got his Air, uh, AirPods in with music blasting too to drown out the pain. Good stuff. Well, some great shots here of this uh, of this Crit City Slam circuit. This is called the Downtown Dolphin. Uh, well, that's, that's this is the way we ride it. You can actually ride it in the other direction as well. But it is a special course. It's an event-only course. But as OJ said at the top of the program, an hour or so after this race has finished, you can actually race on this circuit as well. So get uh, onto the Zwift Companion app or head to Zwift.com forward slash, uh, slash events. And for the next four days or so, you can actually race on this circuit. Just pick an event that suits your, uh, your abilities and your standard, and you can have a go of racing like these elite riders. As we look at Andrzej Poszkopko of the Polish, uh, the Polish team there, very, very good rider indeed. And although we've got a big bunch here together, Hannah, we've started to lap a few riders. I think the relentless nature of this course, the fact there's not much opportunity for recovery is, mean, is meaning that this field is slowly but surely whittling itself down. Yeah, it certainly is. I think there's around um, 38 riders left in this front group. So although it looks uh, quite a large group, um, there's definitely riders starting to uh, just lose contact. You know, what one second, two seconds, three seconds off the back. Um, but, you know, on a course like this, it's really hard to, to get back on. You have to almost make a, a, a huge sprint to, to make it back into the into the group. Um, and as you said before, because this is an event only um, circuit and world, um, a lot of these riders actually won't have ever ridden on here before so I, I know uh, as you mentioned before John Mould he raced on it last night just to familiarize himself with it again um, so it, those riders who've ridden it before do have the upper hand of, of where to make the effort where they can recover um, and also where to move up as well yeah definitely we are seeing this uh, this field slowly but surely whittle down there is that dog leg that 180 degree turn leading back up the finishing straight they come into that with a lot of pace which means, of course, just like IRL, just like in the real world, you are going to need to be very, very well placed because it's only about eight, seven or eight seconds of effort once you've opened up the taps from that final corner. So just like in a real crit, Hannah, positioning, especially in the last couple of laps, is going to be absolutely crucial. And therefore, because there's going to be that fight for position, people are going to want to stay in the top 10, top 15 riders, even a little bit higher into the last lap. All that means, the net result is the pace gets higher and higher and higher. Yeah, higher and higher, and it's just the intensity um, is just you know incredibly high. I think going into that final half a lap, you want to be sort of in the top five, and if you're wanting to take uh, the victory tonight, because obviously this is a scratch race, first cross the line wins. I think from that bottom uh, right uh, right hand on the hairpin, you want to sort of go into that in second or third place to be able to really um, you know throw down the power and, and maximise uh, to take it to to the finish line. I don't think you want to lead it out, uh, but you definitely don't want to be any further back than third place. Indeed, well there, uh, Merkin, the uh, aforementioned Kenneth Merkin, who won just the other day in another race from the, the Belgian Zwift Riders, the BZR team in the dark, the dark jerseys. He's near the front. Ben Healy is there, the Irish rider riding for Trinity Racing, a very, very classy bike rider indeed. And last season won a stage of the Tour de l'Avenir. But Mikey Mottram, wet are all there as well. Wetterall is a very, very good rider. Rode at pro continental level. He's a time trial specialist from Sweden. And the Swedish the team at the Swedish Zwifters with their new livery. I do like their new jersey, Hannah. Yeah, it's I love their new jersey. The, yeah, it reminds me of the Gan jersey from back in the middle of the 90s. You need to look that up on Google. It's a very, very special jersey indeed. But they have Sam Brandland, and he's going to really like this finish. Brownlee just moves off the front, trying to split things up a little bit. Great move by the double Olympic champion. Well, look at that, you know, just putting the power down on that downhill after the little climb and uh, already got one second gap. He's uh, sort of being chased down by Merkin, the, the rider that you were mentioning before from the from Belgium. 
Brownlee just swept up, but that's uh, very good to see him in the mix and uh, making those moves. It, it's quite interesting. If someone makes a move there uh, on the last half a lap, can they you know, go all, uh, full gas, maintain that power and hold on to the finish? Exactly. I think that's a really, really good point. On a circuit like this with six laps to go now, so we're well over half distance. These laps, as we've been commentating and talking, are absolutely a whizzing past. But uh, the way Brownlee moved off the front and the didn't spend too much time off the front. I think he's trying things out. I think because we know that he doesn't possess real punch and a real sprint just by the just by the very nature of the uh, of the sport that he participates in, a far more linear sort of effort, he has the, the attributes to go long. So I guess he's just trying to feel what it's like riding, feels what they wants to feel what it's like just going over the crest of that climb and feeling what it's like on the descent, putting power through the pedal. So I think he's sniffing out the other potentially the opportunity to go for a long one which is very shrewd very intelligent yeah uh, the speed as well is at 48 kilometers per hour right now as well so to, for him to be able to uh, make a bit of a move off the front as well he's just you know sort of telling us what he might want to do in uh, in the coming laps um but yeah also i know a lot of riders they like to make a bit of an effort during the race just to test the legs kind of open up the lungs a little bit and then they'll sit back in uh, in the peloton recover just watch what's going on follow any moves uh, keep themselves caught almost anonymous uh, and then sort of launch another attack later toward, uh, towards the latter end of the race indeed was well, as rory townsend just using an aero power up over the top of the climb from tat canyon dhb Again, a very, very classy rider. Lots of big wins on the domestic circuit in the United Kingdom as a few more riders are being lapped. Bridges now from Great Britain closes the lap. Massa there is from Italy as well. A few little tentative moves going here. And as a result, the bunch really stringing out on this downhill section here. Just watch the way the speed picks up here. 56 kilometers an hour. Townsend still on the front as another lap rider is mopped up. It won't be very long before they just head round that final u-bend and up through the finish and another lap will be ticked down the legs really must be hurting because all of these riders in the top 10 on the right hand side there if you look at their watts per kilogram they're all holding between 4.5 and 5.5 watts a kilo that is gonna hurt yeah, this is really intense. Now we see Zach Bridges, the 19-year-old Welsh rider who is on the uh, Great Britain Senior Academy, coming to the front, a track rider. So he'll suit this style of racing. Also up there, Mikey Mottram once again, and uh, John Mould as well. Also another good track rider. So we'll uh, be used to this, you know, real high intensi uh, intensity uh, of racing as we see a few more draft power-ups being used now. Yeah, a lot of riders just making sure they keep themselves at or near the head of affairs. One of the riders who's been very active, Ben Healy. I haven't seen Tom Pidcock too much at the moment, but I've seen, uh, seen a couple of Trinity jerseys just midway through the bunch. That's the, uh, the rather fanciful uh, diagonal black and white jersey. And a couple of uh, the uh, draft power-ups being used as we head towards the back part of the circuit. John Archwell being picked up there by, uh, by Ribble Welltight. Again, he's a very, very good all-round rider. Can time trial very well. Was second in the time trial championship of Great Britain. And then backed that up, Hannah, didn't he? By third in the road race as well. Very, very impressive rider. Yeah, it's very, very impressive. It just showed uh, his strength. Um, and also, you know, he's not just a time trialist. He can road race as well. And he's very, very good on the track. So, uh, yeah, Archibald, uh, the brother of Katie Archibald, the Olympic champion. So, yeah. Very, very good genes in that uh, family and actually uh, got a note before the race started to say, say hi to my mum, Louise. So, hi, Louise. <laughs> Great stuff. <laughs> well, I tell you what, we're, we're just looking at the head of affairs there, that's Drew Christensen. He's running for the NTT Continental Cycling Team and, of course, won the Zwift Academy in 2019 and won himself a contract with the uh, under-23 NTT squad. He's got two teammates with him today, Leonardo Macchiori of Italy and another Italian, Riccardo Bobo. So great to see Drew in the mix there. And one rider, well, it's actually Drew Christensen. He's gone clear at the moment, six seconds gap. Well, Townsend, should I say. So Townsend has gone clear at the moment, 450 watts, just underneath, just under six watts a kilo. This is a big, big effort, but there's still four laps to go. But maybe a little bit of a, a move to just to test the ground, maybe even to a, try and uh, be the catalyst or provide the catalyst for a breakaway. But I tell you what, they are not giving him too much space at all. He is back and in the fold of the peloton. Yeah, well, we still have uh, Christian out, Sin out front uh, seven seconds. It's Seaman now who's uh, on the front of that bunch. And then Merkin of the uh, Belgian Zwift riders. 
coming to the front, uh, world champion in the triathlon, Vincent Louis uh, from France coming up as well. And also Ollie Jones from Canyon ZCC. So we've not seen much of uh, any of those riders. They've kept themselves very an anonymous uh, throughout tonight's race. What have they uh, got up their sleeves? Stevie Young is a very, very good sprinter on that squad. So uh, I think, in my opinion, they'll be uh, trying to sprint for him tonight. So, uh, I, I, uh, the I'd imagine there'll be a f in, indeed. Sorry, sorry to cut across there, Hannah. No, indeed, it's uh, just interested by that move from Christensen. Opened up a gap very, very quickly indeed. We should get the stats on the right-hand side in just a minute, just to see what has happened there. But Townsend, a couple of other riders there, a couple of the Kiss Racing team. There are a few teams here that uh, that uh, that knows with very, 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 very well indeed. That are just backing things off a little bit. Maybe letting some of the other teams head to the front conserving their energy which on a course like this because of the, the intensity because of the relentless nature of the course that's a pretty good tactic to use especially if you know the course and you've raced on it before yeah knowing the course uh, you know it gives you such an advantage it's like uh, you know in real life racing you'll always do um, a recce of a crit or if you're doing a time trial you'll always do a re recce and make sure you know you know the turns uh, um, and the course like the back of your hand you know sort of where it gets hard where you need to make your effort uh, sort of also knowing on this on this course uh, the climb doesn't look like much but after you know several laps it start, certainly starts to take its toll on the legs um, as you see Mikey Mottram now of Vitus Pro cycling up towards the front he's got a slight gap again on at the top of this climb going down into the descent Damien Clayton at the front as well as uh, Mikey Mottram starts to to get swept in by the peloton so it means that you know it's so hard to stay away or even get one or two seconds gap indeed well Brownlee again moves to the front you know mixing it very very well he's got that sort of engine that can stay never slips back too far he can certainly deliver the power to maintain a slot at the front as Mikey Mottram drops right back to the back of that group after that little move on the front. Just coming into the last couple of laps now, 23.7 kilometers down, four laps to go. Saying on the right hand side there, we're in the last couple of laps to be perfectly honest with you. It's remember 1.9 uh, kilometers per, per lap, which is a smidge over a mile, 1.2 miles. But to the field still all together, so, so hard for any rider to really make an impression. I have a feeling, without wanting to predict or uh, throw in the curse of the commentator, the Hannah, but uh, this could come down to one mightily spectacular bunch sprint. Yeah, I think it's going to be one of the most exciting finishes uh, we've seen uh, in the Swift Classic so far. I think looking at Mikey Mottram just a minute ago where he was at the front, as soon as he took the power off the pedals, he was straight to the back of that peloton. So showing how vital it is to, to keep your eye on the ball, um, to sort of keep yourself uh, well positioned as well, because it's going to be very, very hard for him to make it back towards the front of this bunch again um, with only you know two laps remaining. Indeed, well, Mottram again. Uh, as I say that, I was going to say he's back towards the front already. <laughs> well, he's, uh, he's clearly recovering well. He's clearly been putting in the, the right sort of training. And you really do need to do a lot of intervals to, to, to excel and race on Zwift. There's a raft of power-ups, a flotilla uh, of power-ups now being used. Feather power-ups for this climb. That's the one that you want. A lot of draft power-ups as you look at Tom Peacock still clearly in the mix. Moving to the front. This is good to see the multiple world champion excels across all disciplines and towards the back end of this Zwift Classic, the final Zwift Classic of the series. The silver medalist in this year's Elite Cyclocross World Championships is still in the mix. Cruising down this uh, downhill section, then they'll soon hit the U-bit in the back through the finish. But Hannah, great to see Tom Peacock in the mix. And crucially, this guy has got a kick as well, a former, amongst all the other titles he holds, British Criterium champion as well. Yeah, he's got a great punchy kick on him. Um, fantastic to see, you know, only in the third Swift Classics now. It is the final one, but seeing him go from strength to strength, he's learnt from each round, um, and great to see him still in the mix. Obviously, he said uh, in the first round in London, he attacked, didn't realise, you know, once he freewheeled, the group swept, uh, swept him up and he was out the back before he, he knew it. So he's learnt from his mistakes from the previous two rounds, and, you know, he's playing dividends right now. He's up in the front, and uh, as you said, Matt, you know, he's got a great kick on him. Won't be surprised if we uh, see him, you know, taking the victory tonight. I know uh, OJ said at the top of the show, um, you know, could be one to watch tonight. 
Indeed, definitely one to watch. Well, he's at the head of affairs, just staying out of trouble. Clearly has adapted very, very well. This is in stark contrast to his earlier performances. Just couldn't quite get it right, but tonight he is looking very, very good. There's one and three quarter laps to go. You can just see everybody jostling, jostling for position. Merkin, the Belgian, who's won recently on this circuit, always at the head of affairs. Rory Townsend, one of the most aggressive riders in this race today, always at the front. Looking, sniffing out the action. Pitcock still midway through the centre here. The very, very strong Polish rider, Pozepsko, is also there as well as Clayton now takes to the front for a wibble, a ribble, a well tight. Yeah, Clayton, another very, very strong rider. He's won uh, the UCI race, uh, GP Marbiers last year. So, uh, you know, great talent uh, from the ribble well tight team. Also, uh, Vincent Louis comes towards the front now, the uh, triathlon uh, world champion from France, the 30-year-old. Uh, been very, very present in all the Zwift classics, actually, so uh, great to see him up towards the front. It, I'm not sure whether, it, whether he'll be racing and, and working for Alistair Brownlee, though, uh, as we have been seeing him up the front uh, so much, keeping uh, his teammate protected. Well, there's certainly plenty of uh, the All-Stars team in the mix still. And there's the shot of Tom Peacock. Things starting to thin out. They've just come over the crest of that climb. There's Clayton for Ribble. A couple of Canyon ZCC riders. Watch out for Lionel Vyasan. He's not touched the front at all. He's conserved his energy and he is there in the top 10, just moving, floating up and down. Krull is where is there as well for SEG Racing. Very, very good time trial is, as we mentioned before. There is the picture in picture of the British rider, Damien Clayton. Headband on jersey off looking comfortable on the hoods there 370 watts the optimum cadence of 91 rpm and a very high heart rate hannah just heading in for the penultimate time into the finishing straight this time through they will receive the virtual the virtual belt this is the final lap of the swift classics who is going to run out the winner and it does look as if it's going to be a bunch sprint but look at the riders struggling to hold on to the peloton as the pace gets more ferocious yeah, riders want to uh, try and start to move up now, get into the position that they want to be. Optimum would be, you know, in the top 10. We've seen uh, Tom Pickup up towards the front now. He has been yo-yoing from around 60th back up and uh, back up towards the front. So, you know, he's learning that uh, how to draft in this peloton as well. Mikey Mottram as ever up towards the front as well. And Rory Townsend of the Canyon DHB team uh, also up towards the front. So uh, this is going to be a mass sprint finish. Well, Merkin goes again to the front. He's overtaken by Clayton again from Ribble. Krull is there as well. Great ride from the rider from SEG. Louis now moves to the front as well. Wetterall is there for the Swedish as Zwift races. Lots of teams still in the mix, still in with a shout. Brandland, Sam Brandland moves up. Number fourth last week in Richmond and one of the most regular winners on Zwift. Look out for him in that white jersey. Mold now moves to the front as well. And Vyasan also there. And a big attack here by Wetterall consummate TT rider but suddenly goes straight over the top but this is the final drag of this race and they go under the Flam Rouge Hannah one kilometer to go well if you just saw the numbers there from Wetterall over 600 watts now as we see one kilometer to go as we start to see a move off the front and it is cruel and Gavin Dempster the Scottish rider from draft off the front 11.9 watts per kilo they've got a one second gap to Bigham Mottram also in there but it's Gavin Dempster going solo now he has two seconds lead over uh, Wetterall now can this be uh, going to victory for the Scottish rider Matt? Well, the Scottish rider is still putting out over 10 watts a kilogram. He's been in the top 10 a couple of times recently. This will be an amazing win for Team Draft. But can he hold on? His lap is coming down. The gap is coming down, shall I say. And there he is, picture in picture, 600 watts. Round that bend for the final time. It looks like the rider from Team Draft is going to take a monumental victory. Or has he been swept up? Oh, he's been swept up in sight of the line. It looks as if it was McGlinchey who eventually took the win. Cruel cruel win there by McGlinchey it looked as if Dempster was going to take it but in the last dying moments of the Crit City Slam it looked as if McGlinchey stole it in the last few meters we'll get of course confirmation but what an amazing race that was Wow, what a finish that was. It, you know, it looked like Dempster was going to seal that one and wrap it up, but almost solo victory, but just got caught on the line. It was very, very close. As we see uh, the results now, it's the Irish rider of Vitus Pro Cycling, Connor, uh, Chris McGlinchey, who gets the victory tonight. So that's back-to-back -back victories for Vitus Pro Cycling. Ollie Jones up there and Brad Gavarius, two of Turbo. What a wonderful win there by uh, McGlinchey.
Great riding by the rider from Vitus, Ollie Jones, Canyon said CZ, as you said, in second position. These riders were a complete blanket finish. Brad Guveris there from South African Team Turbo. Good result. Another consistent performance from Sam Brandlin from the Swedish uh, Swift Riders in fourth position. And just look at the stats. Look at the average watts just down the right-hand side. 5.2 watts a kilogram won the day, but that was a very, very smart ride. And the rest of the top 10 from the indoor specialists, we have Larsen, then we have Levy of Kiss Racing, the ever-present Manuel Vyasan of Canyon ZCC. Then we have Rory Townsend, and then the brave, brave rider from Scotland and Team Draft, Gavin Dempster. I nearly called him the victor. It wasn't to be, but he managed to scrape just inside the top 10. And then we have Ryan Christensen from Canyon DHB rounding out the top 10. Well, Hannah, we knew that was going to be exciting. But what an absolutely rip-roaring finale that it was. I mean, hats off to Gavin Dempster. But what can you say? Perfect timing by McGlinchey to take the win for Vitus. Yeah, that was perfect, wasn't it? And it was so close. Just uh, two tenths of, of a second, just less than two, Ollie Jones. So really, you know, timing and positioning was key. As we've said throughout this whole series, you know, knowing where to be on the course. Um, and they certainly got a... a, a Lot, uh, a lot of uh, time to look at where they need to be on tonight's uh, course but fantastic riding from uh, Gavin Dempster there from draft uh, really a heroic effort and uh, to still get in the top 10 but only you know 0.79 of a second uh, from taking tonight's victory I think it just shows how uh, understanding how you put the power through the bike, understanding the use of power-ups. And, and, and as we discussed at length beforehand, understanding at what point to accelerate, especially on these technical circuits. The more you race them, the more you get used to it. But uh, we say fortune favours the brave. It wasn't, the, okay, it wasn't to, to be that way today from, from Dempster. But I tell you what, it made for a super race. Very exciting, and that was the most notable attack of the night. Uh, as we look at, so this is uh, with a couple of laps to go, still 9.4 k's to go here. And this is uh, one of the points where Brownlee was on the front. And again, Brownlee rode a very aggressive race. He's just getting better at better at this uh, Zwift racing discipline, isn't he? Yeah, he certainly is. And I think that goes for everyone, as we saw Pidcock as well. You know, the more you race on Zwift, uh, the more you get used to it, the more you learn. Um, know, knowing the riders as well who are around you, the ones to watch, uh, starting to know the, the courses as well. Uh, get another look here when uh, Townsend was up towards the front with Zach Bridges of the Great Britain cycling team. So this, you know, was another notable effort, but there wasn't, you know, many attacks or big moves going off the front the pace was just so high um, and there was so much power and that tells in the uh, the average power at the end of the race well here we go this was uh, another action replay you can just see the field snaking around this uh, wonderful circuit this was just coming into the uh, the final lap in fact still all together we discussed tom pidcock just finished outside the top 10 did pidcock well, that was actually with three or well, one lap to go should i say the lap counter just a little bit late on that occasion but we talked about Tom, uh, Tom Pidcock uh, trying to animate this race. Uh, he's learning fast, isn't he? Great to see him in at the kill towards the back end there. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. And he's just, you know, going from strength to strength, uh, you know, learning as ever um, and really embracing this platform now. As he said, you know, he used it uh, just before the UCI uh, Cyclocross World Championships where he took a silver medal. Um, and yeah, if you see now tonight, he's uh, just out, uh, outside the top 20 in their 23rd place. Um, you know, if you compare that to where he was um, in the first uh, round of the Classics in London, um, I think it's only the only way is up for uh, Tom Pickock uh, in, in Swift Racing. Indeed. Well, that's been a wonderful event. I mean, I'm, I'm almost drenched in sweat myself here. Goodness knows what the riders are going to be like. They'll be earning a, a well-earned rest because that was <laughs> spectacular. We always knew that uh, today was going to be uh, a wonderful race on that unique circuit. But just as a little bit of a reminder, we mentioned it midway through the race. But of course, you can race on this circuit in around an hour's time or pretty much in, not too long after this broadcast has finished. So uh, use your companion app or go on to Zwift.com forward slash events and, uh, and you, can, uh, you can race on this circuit. But remember, it's just for four days. And then, of course, we've got it's well, first up, uh, Hannah, it's been a great series. The classics are always wonderful. They're getting better and better. We're getting uh, more and more exciting racing. The fields are getting stronger and stronger. It's great to see riders coming across from the road and tackling racing on Zwift. Um, it's really something to celebrate, isn't it, at the moment? Yeah, it certainly is. Not just uh, cyclists from, you know, in the UCI professional world, but also um, a lot of triathletes come in to race now. Uh, we've also got a lot of uh, dedicated e-racing teams. So it's just brilliant. And the racing is, you know, so exciting. 
uh, week in week. It's, it's just brilliant. Um, but of course, that doesn't stop there. Running from the 4th of May until the 30th of May, the Tour for All is an opportunity for cyclists, triathletes and runners from the Zwift community to help Zwift support Doctors Without Borders uh, in their response to COVID-19. And uh, Zwift are kicking off the tour with a $125,000 donation to uh, Doctors Without Borders to COVID-19 crisis fund to support the organization's global emergency response to the pandemic and its consequences. Um, and they'll be matching that donation at the end of the tour if 250,000 Zwifters finish, Zwifters finish at least one stage. So check uh, that out at Zwift.com forward slash TFA ride and Zwift.com TFA run to register for the event. And I think you can be able to find it on the Zwift companion app as well. Um, so together we can make the tour for all the most impactful and multi-stage event yet. So let's go with this. Uh, power in numbers is key. I reckon we'll easily do that. I mean, uh, I know we've had people watching this tonight. L lots of people, of course, have ridden the Tour of Utopia, the Tour de Zwift. Um, and I think we've got a lot of people on the platform at the moment. And I, and I think, you know, it's such a, such a worthy cause, uh, to, uh, especially at the present time, of course. And uh, I'm looking forward. I'm certainly going to register. I might have to have a bit of a lie down first after the excitement of this race. But you should definitely see me on Zwift in, in the coming weeks. Remember, that does start on, uh, on May the 4th. So I look forward to seeing you on Zwift in the next few weeks. But... Uh, well, for now, it uh, just takes me to, to thank you all for tuning in over the last couple of weeks for the Zwift Classics. We'll be back racing with you very, very soon. So keep your eyes on Zwift on social media as well to keep up with all of the updates in relation to what is coming next. But for now, from me and from Hannah Walker, it's good night and stay safe wherever you are. Thanks for watching. Bye.